Welcome into another off-season edition of Bills Take Two. I'm Jonathan Acosta, joined here by our WGRZ Bills insider, Vic Carucci. And Vic, since the last time we spoke, the Bills have really done some work on that defensive line, especially in the interior. They've confirmed the signings of former Chargers defensive tackle Austin Johnson and former Panthers defensive lineman Deshaun Williams. Vic, what do you see as Brandon Bean's strategy here with really beefing up that interior of the defensive line? Because you have Ed Oliver, you have Daquan Jones, and now you have really good depth behind them as well. I love the way they've approached the addressing of the defensive line because inside is where you're going to get the most effective pressure. Yes, the sacks are piled up by those on the edge, but it starts with the people in the middle. And, you know, you've seen one of the, the greatest in Aaron Donald to play this game, who recently retired, how effective and, and how much he can affect the outcome of a game by bringing that middle pressure. Now, you're not getting necessarily another Aaron Donald on any team, but trying to replicate the ability to push it up the middle, uh, to disrupt the run game, of course, is something that every team wants. And by having the depth there, you can bring in fresher people those bigger guys who wear down as the game goes on. But if you keep rotating them, that allows you to stay fresh in the late stages of a game. Do you think there's an element here, Vic, of maybe some question marks, some, some youth in, in, the, in the back end, in the secondary, that maybe a way to counteract that is to have some experience and have some experience and some beef up front to maybe, maybe shift the, the strength of the defense to maybe the front seven instead of the back seven? I don't think there's any question that Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott took into account the uncertainty in their secondary when addressing the front seven. Granted, you know, the secondary's got to hold up and they're responsible for putting the right pieces there. And I, I think they should believe uh, with the additions that they've made uh, in the offseason and what they already had in place that they can hold up in the secondary. But it would be much better, much easier to function there if you've got a strong pass rush. Now, the Bills are still lacking, I think, a quality edge rusher, uh, losing Leonard Floyd in free agency, which was kind of expected, is something they've got to offset somehow, but it's probably going to be the draft. It, it, it wasn't a free agency move that was going to help them there. Keeping A.J. Epinesa was important, but it and you still have Von Miller, but it doesn't... Uh, to me, take away from the need to have a real stud edge rusher added to this team. But that said, if the front seven as a whole, counting the tackles, do their part, then it can allow the secondary, I think, to function better than it would if you didn't have any quality up front. You bring up the draft. We're less than a month away. You, and you bring up pass rusher as well. Where does pass rusher rank among the needs for this team going into the draft, especially when you weigh against maybe a cornerback or safety or a wide receiver? I think it's in the top three of the conversation. It feels like this draft is set up to give the Bills a quality receiver and probably a quality cornerback. And just knowing Sean McDermott's philosophy believing that a defense has to be built back to front with strength uh, and using the draft to do so like he did in 2017 with Tredavious White. I think they'll look there, and, and it could go one way or the other in the first round with receiver or corner. I'm leaning toward receiver, but after that, edge rusher can't be too far behind, and that's something that you could maybe get in the third round, uh, perhaps, or, or higher than that uh, as far as how the draft might fall, but it, it, they're going to have their eye open for that. Those are the ranking uh, three needs, I think, on this team. This is not considered a big draft for safety, which is why the uh, Mike Edwards acquisition and free agency was so important. So I think they, while they might draft a safety somewhere along the line, I don't know that it's going to be a, a premium pick for them to address, just given the lack of depth at the safety position in the draft. And as the Bills are continuing to build their draft board and look and look at players that they want to bring onto their team, maybe an added, an added element is returnability, especially in the wake of the kickoff rules changes that were adopted at the owners' meetings. Do you think that teams, and maybe specifically the Bills, 
take that into consideration now where they're looking at a defensive back or a wide receiver and see if they have some returnability in college that, that could be maybe an increased valuable asset now in the NFL? I think one of the fascinating aspects of this offseason and training camp for all the teams, but you know, we're talking about the Bills here, is finding multiple game breakers on the receiving end of kickoffs. Having more than one guy that you can put there, likely there will be two, because you can position uh, two people in that drop zone area between the 20 and the goal line. And I, I think the way it's set up, you can, depending on, on where the, the kickoff is, is directed or caught, uh, you have the ability to either have the guy who catches it straight on run and, and find a little crease and then go, or you know do some gadget plays, pitch the ball one side or another to also throw off those defenders. Because uh, again, it's such a short area where the coverage team is lining up at the 40, uh, at the receiving team's 40, and, and then having those blockers at the 35, just five yards in front of them, and I, I think the navigation of that, uh, just looking at how it worked in the XFL, uh, you definitely had some people who struggled to kind of cover those areas. And all it takes is one little seam and the return man's gone. And maybe how much is that an area that the Bills are looking to, to strengthen, even if these rule changes weren't adopted? Because you could say that kickoff returns weren't necessarily a strength of the team last year. They really, you, really only one return touchdown special teams comes to mind with the Deontay Hardy return against the Dolphins. Yeah, the, the need for speed is going to be tantamount to, I think, everything this team does. I think for special teams, it's critical, and it will color some of the work that they do uh, in terms of the draft, uh, whether it's receiver, whether it's running back, you know, the, the obvious positions that factor into re the return game. Sometimes it's defensive back as well, but also what else these players can do at regular positions, uh, having some good depth there. So, you know, we saw it last year as the injuries mounted on the back end of the defense. The, the desperate need to have people who can step in. But those people can start out as people who play special teams. And usually, and, the, and this is the, the critical part, I think, of the new kickoff rule, you're going to have so many rookies involved on, on both ends of this. That's usually the case. And that's often where you get the mistakes because they're just finding their way into the NFL and they, they are prone to those errors that can give up big plays. So you may not see great special teams play throughout the league uh, because A, the adjustment to a new kickoff format that's different, that's different than what's done on the collegiate level as well as the NFL level, but also uh, just the lack of experience. We also heard from Brandon Bean, from Sean McDermott at the meetings down in Orlando. Uh, another rule change was adopted with the, with the hip drop tackle. Just what, what were your overall takeaways from, from the meetings down in Orlando this past week? I side with many of the players with the NFL Players Association uh, in terms of the skepticism on the enforcement of this hip drop tackle situation. I, I think where you have blatant uh, areas where players could be causing injury by tackling from behind, I, I get the concern there. And you're going to have officials trying to find what is more blatant than not? And that's a judgment. And when you get into judgment, it's difficult to really tell what is just a basic tackle, get it, catching a guy from behind and a ball carrier and pulling him to the ground versus doing it with a technique that can cause the ball carrier to be injured. And I think there's going to be a big struggle with that. So that was one of my, my big takeaways that the Bills, uh, like other teams, are going to have to manage this both from a defensive standpoint, and you know that'll be Sean McDermott, Bobby Babich, uh, those defensive coaches on trying to teach techniques that will avoid a 15-yard penalty that can be game-changing. And on the offensive side, teaching your ball carriers to feign that they're being pulled down in an illegal way. Drop your head to your left or to your right. That will be a, an absolute part of preparing for the season 
practicing how to look like you're being uh, tackled in a hip drop way. And then as far as, uh, and this was something that, you know, that the Bills um, were pushing for, uh, the, the rule of declaring an injured player, this was a Bills proposal, declaring an injured player injured before a team gets on the plane to go to a road game. You know, you would think that that would be an obvious type of thing, but it wasn't. And often you'd find out who wasn't or wasn't on a trip uh, through maybe an agent uh, leaking it to a reporter. Uh, now teams are going to be required to say who is injured and not making the trip before that plane leaves for a road game. I thought that was one of those off the under the radar uh, big deals. And then there's this one uh, that struck me, and that is the involvement of a replay official with the plays that happen in or out of the pocket. And you're talking about, of course, intentional grounding, where there are calls that are made on that, that replays can often show were incorrect, uh, or a roughing the passer call, uh, or you know, a call, the, the call of a pass being thrown or incomplete uh, because of, again, the timing of when the ball leaves the hand of the passer. And this gets very interesting because the call can be made that, you know, a player was, say, uh, shouldn't have been called as being down. The ball got out of his hand and caught. And now the replay official, while he cannot or she can't add the yardage that's gained after the catch, it's only to the point where the ball was caught. Uh, you're going to have, counting the, the, you know, the kickoff thing, the hip drop tackle, uh, these these involvements that will that will have the replay official, you're going to have, I think, more, not less, confusion discussion. If you thought officiating was was something that drove you crazy before watching games, this season could bring about a whole new layer of all of that. Might see a lot more complaints on, about officiating on social media than we're than we're <laughs> used to. Uh, one more thing, Vic. Uh, I think uh, before we end, we have to touch on the the topic of the seat licenses with the Bills Stadium. I know our news team here at Channel Two has done some great reporting on it this week, talking with season ticket holders that I guess you could say are encountering sticker shock when they go and find out how much those seat licenses are for for the new Bills Stadium. Just for maybe for our audience, can you explain maybe what the process is with these seat licenses? Why why teams with these new stadiums are going with the route of these PSLs, and just what your take on the whole situation is? Yeah, seat licenses have been around for a while. They actually originated at the college level and then were adopted uh, by the pros. And the the basic cause or reason for them is to help offset the cost, the private cost of building a new stadium. Uh, you get public money involved, and in some places there's more public money than others. In, in Buffalo in particular, there is more public money, a smaller market than say Los Angeles, where Stan Kroenke financed the largest portion uh, and, and also the Chargers as, as being part of that because they're the other team that plays there. But Stan Kroenke funding the largest portion of SoFi Stadium. We don't have a, a situation like that here. So taxpayer money uh, accounts for the majority of the $1.7 billion that is earmarked to be the price tag of the, of, uh, the new Highmark Stadium. But the, the, private, the, the money that is in the overage and the private side of the contribution, meaning from Terry Pagula from the Bills, uh, this is where the seat license funds come into play. Basically, taking the one-time payment to own, uh, to, to have the right to buy a seat, it's not the price of the seat, it's the right to buy a seat, and then scaling that, and that's where I think people are, are gonna have their biggest problems. Number one, seat license as a whole, that whole, that whole concept is new to this market. So. There was always going to be some level of sticker shock regardless of the price. But when you see at the highest end, and that's where that 50,000 a seat uh, situation came into play when you were dealing with suites and club seats at the, at the highest end, that, that number leaking out, uh, that's where you, you start to say, wow, okay, then what happens with my seat, say, that's, that's not in a suite or in a club area, it's just in the general bowl of the stadium? It'll be significantly less than that, but there'll still be a price on it. 
And I think the other problem, and we've heard the politicians sound off on this, Mark Poland cards in particular, is a lack of transparency. That he understands, as we all do, that the, the bills can put whatever price tag they want on it. It's a private business, and, and they have customers who buy their tickets or buy their seat license, and you're, you're, you're going to not prevent them from doing it. You're going to just decide whether or not you want to pay the price. But what is the price, and why is there such a cloud around it? And it raises the thought that you're, you're, you're trying to maybe pull something over on people, giving them little time or no time to really prepare for what they're going to have to pay for. This is a major investment for a whole lot of people. This is not to be trivialized. You're talking about financing that's necessary to pay these numbers, financing that's made available to make it easier on the customer, but nonetheless financing. And we haven't even gotten into the actual cost of the tickets when this new stadium opens. And you know it's going to be significantly higher than what you're paying now for those uh, seats that have already gone up in price. And they're just not going to get any lower. They're, they're going to be, I think, I think extremely high for the market, which has always been one of the lower price tickets in the entire NFL. But add that to the seat license, to all your game day costs of parking and, and refreshments and everything else, um, the, ex the expensive outing is going to, I think, change the dynamic of your crowd. I, I think you're pricing out a lot of people already. They know it before they even have their opportunity to see whether or not they want to buy seats for this place. Um, but then the, the whole idea that there are, what, 10,000 or, or more fewer seats than in the current Highmark Stadium. So smaller place. Uh, lesser availability, higher prices. And when it's all said and done, what are you able to be a part of? Is, are, we, are we talking about a Bills team that is one of the very best in the NFL that's uh, continually going to contend for Super Bowls? You would think that that will be the case as long as Josh Allen is the quarterback. But you know, trying to look into the future is another element to this that isn't overlooked. I mean, people are considering that. What, what kind of product do you get in 2026? Because there's no guarantee that it's going to be great. It might be. It might be the greatest thing that you have to have a ticket for, but who knows? A really fascinating topic. I know Bills fans have a lot of questions that they hope they get answers to in the coming weeks, months, and even years. Bills offseason, it's never boring. Vic, thank you so much for joining us with your analysis, and we look forward to talking with you next week. All right, Jonathan.